table together. Uh, if, does anyone need a communion cup before we start? I think we got everybody. Yes, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, in verse 23, the Apostle Paul gives us instruction on how to come to the Lord's table. He says, For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you eat, uh, as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show forth the Lord's death till he comes. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. And so as we take of the Lord's table, we're reminded of what Christ did for us on Calvary. Uh, his body was battered and bruised, uh, and he uh, shed his blood for us. He uh, hung on the cross as a substitutionary death for us. He died in our place. He shed his blood as an atoning uh, power of God to be able to cover all of our sins and give us complete victory. And uh, when we get ready to take up the communion, he says that we're to examine ourselves. And so we are to take and uh, uh, go before the Lord and ask the Lord to show us what sins or what things are in our life that's hindering our relationship with him or our walk with him. And as we uh, pray, then uh, God speaks to our hearts and we confess those sins before the Lord. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let's take time now to pray before we take of the bread and ask the Lord to show us what it is that we need to confess before him. And those that have just came in, anybody need uh, communion cups? You guys get communion out there? You got them? You guys get them? Good. All right. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask God to show us what needs to be confessed before we take of the bread. reconciled to a living God. I pray that you bless this bread to our bodies. We thank you, Lord, for uh, the significance of what it represents, the precious body of Christ being sacrificed for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. It says, and when he had given thanks, he break it and said, take eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup. The wonderful thing about the cup is it represents to us the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed so as to be able to atone for our sins. Hebrews tells us without the shedding of blood, there is no remissions of sins. And so Jesus Christ shed his blood so that we might be able to be free from the bondage of the sin that controlled us and condemned us and give it now gives us hope in heaven. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Thank the Lord for what he has done for us on Calvary uh, and ask the Lord's blessing as we continue to observe the Lord's Supper together. 
same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so he says, so, uh, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show forth the Lord's death till he comes. What a glorious opportunity we have to gather and to remember all that Christ has done for us. We're going to stand, we're going to sing a song at Calvary. All right. Thank you. 
Text of what's going on in the life of Joseph, and then we're going to uh, take a look at his life, evaluate it, and see what it, uh, how we can make an application of that into our own personal lives today. The Lord made it to prosper. I'm thankful that all the struggles, all the difficulties that Joseph went through, God was with him still, and he made whatever he put his hand to to prosper. And I believe that God can prosper us, God can bless us. Uh, and no matter what the trial or the difficulty is that we're going through. Genesis chapter 39, verse 1. It says, And Joseph was brought uh, down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, uh, which uh, had brought him uh, down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. And he was in uh, the house of his, ma of his master, the Egyptian, and his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in the sight of, and in his sight, and he served him, and he made him overseer over his house, and all that he had put into his hand. And it came to pass, from the time that he had made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that had uh, he had in the house and in the field. 
And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not all he had save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph and said, Lie with me. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wanteth not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is no, none greater in this house than I. Neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this wick, uh, great wickedness and sin against God? And it came to pass, as she spake to Joseph day by day, that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her, or to be with her. And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business. And there was none of the men of the house there within. And she called him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. And it came to pass when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and was fled forth, uh, that she called unto the men of her house and spake unto them saying see he hath brought in a Hebrew unto us to mock us he came in unto me to lie with me and I cried with a loud voice and it came to pass when he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried that he left his garment with me and fled and got him out and she laid up his garment by her until the Lord came home and she spake unto him according to these words, saying, The Hebrew servant, which thou hast brought unto us, came in unto me to mock me. And it came to pass, as I lifted up my voice and cried, that he left his garment with me and fled out. And it came to pass, when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spake unto him, saying, After this matter did thy servant to me, that, he was, that his wrath was kindled. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and uh, he was there in the prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison. And whatsoever they did there, he was the door of it. The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand, because the Lord was with him, and that he that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be together this morning. Help us to learn some things in a practical way about uh, Joseph and about the God of Joseph. Uh, Lord, that we might be able to learn uh, how you can be with us in the midst of difficulties and trials, situations that we absolutely have no control over. Uh, we're aware of the fact that, God, you're still on the throne and you're in control of all things. I pray that you might bless us. You might use us in a great way. Uh, the world is so mixed up and confused right now. Uh, help us, Lord, to give uh, some common sense directives to others on what is going on in our world and how God is still in control of all things and how God can bless us even in the midst of the trials that we're facing and going through. I would pray, Lord, for someone listening by the way of the live stream or here in the uh, sanctuary together with us that's not saved. I pray the Spirit of God will impress upon their hearts that they need to be born again. And Lord, may they call on the name of Jesus Christ and be wonderfully forgiven and saved this morning. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord made it to prosper. Our text verses, verse 3, says his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper by his hand. Then in verse 23, it says the keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand because the Lord was with him and that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. Uh, it's amazing to study the life of Joseph. Many of us are familiar with the life of Joseph. If you've been saved a while, for sure, you probably read through Genesis and you read about the life of Joseph. 
But I want to highlight some things in his life that will be a help to us. He certainly went through much controversy, experienced much suffering, and it would seem that every turn in his life, whichever direction he's going, uh, he would have to face trials and suffering and difficulties. And it, it just seems like sometimes life is like that. It's like we get on this path and it's like, well, no matter where we go, whatever we try to do, it seems like there's always trouble waiting or difficulties to go through. The amazing thing is that Joseph was aware of the fact that no matter what he was facing or whatever he was going through, that God was with him. And what he was experiencing was over and over again, God making him to prosper in spite of the circumstances. So, so, so much so that when you get to the end of Genesis and Genesis chapter 50, when his brothers come down to uh, Egypt uh, so that they might be able to survive during the famine, Joseph reminds them in Genesis 50 and 20, he says, but as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Amen. And Joseph, after evaluating his life and seeing all that God was doing, comes to the conclusion that God was in control in spite of the suffering, in spite of the trial, in spite of the difficulties he was, that he was going through, that it was God that brought all these things to pass. So at that point in the time, in his life, there would be lives that would be saved because of how God would direct him to be able to store up grain uh, for the times of famine in the land. You know, they say statistically, because of COVID-19, that 35% of Christians uh, are not going to church or even watching a live stream service uh, when the, if the opportunity is there. And uh, it's an alarming uh, statistic because of the fact we have allowed COVID-19 to draw us away from our God. And uh, COVID-19 is no different than any other virus or any other situation that we've gone through in life and through history. But uh, we cannot allow it to draw us away from worshiping our God. And 35% have allowed that to take place. They say because of that, the effects of that on the church is that at the conclusion of COVID-19, they're predicting that statistically 20% uh, of churches will close their doors. And that's a, that's a sad thing. Uh, when you think that Jesus said, upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, uh, believers in Christ need to have faith to believe Christ and believe that God is in control and God can bless in spite of whatever may be going on in the world in which we live. And so we're grappling with this whole thing of dealing with COVID-19 and dealing with governmental mandates and all these things. And, and what it has done, it has robbed people of their faith to believe that God is in control and that God can bless. I tell you right now, God knew COVID-19 was going to be here before it got here. And God knows what's going on right now. And if God could take Joseph's life and all the controversy and all the difficulties that he went through and bless him, then God can certainly bless us in these days we were living. This is our day. 2020 is our day. Uh, we can read of great Christians in the past. That was their day. The times they went through. This morning I was thinking... I know back in the 70s and 80s, boy, there was great revivals going on. I mean, churches were being planted. Churches were growing. Christian schools were being started. I mean, it was an exciting time in Christian history in America. Uh, then the Lord smacked me right between the eyes and said, yeah, but you're not living then. You're in 2020. And we have a tendency to look backwards and think that people in the past had it easier than what we have. The reality is they've had their trials, they had their struggles, they had their things they had to go through in, in trusting God to prosper them in the midst of the trials. And so we need to have faith to believe that God is still on the throne and God can still make whatever it is we do to prosper. I just believe that with all my heart. And so I want to look at some things in the life of Joseph, just kind of highlight a few things in his life to see the struggles he dealt with and how God blessed him in spite of those struggles. First of all, he had to deal with hatred. <coughs> We're living in a world where we have to deal with hatred. I, I, I've never seen it, and I'm 68 years old, I've never seen people 
so violently vengeful and hateful towards one another. Uh, it's just, it's, things are out of control. And the only thing that's going to give people a love for each other and a love for country and a love for uh, uh, the church is that they have to be saved, they have to be born again, they have to surrender their life to Jesus Christ. The thing that will make a difference in people's lives that will eliminate hatred is Jesus Christ and Christ alone. But back in Genesis chapter 37, verse 4, notice it says here, And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. And so first of all, hatred manifested itself in Joseph's life by sibling rivalry. It says that his father loved him more than his own brothers, and they hated him. They hated him so much they could not say something peaceably to him. In other words, they could not have a kind word. You know, it just it cracks me up that uh, with President Trump, with the media and different people, th th I don't care what the man does, whether you agree with him or you don't agree with him, they cannot say a kind word about yeah. this man. Amen. Uh, and, and I was listening to some of these debates and things the other day and conversations and uh, listen, our, our, our politicians are vulgar. They're vulgar to the point you can't even listen to what they have to say. All they do is lie, all they have is vengeance, all they have is resentment towards people. Uh, it, I, was, I was wanting to look at some news clips and I turned them off. I said, I can't even look at the news clips because of the vulgarity of the people that are being interviewed, because of the cursing that comes across on the videos. I'm like, this is not something for a Christian to look at. It is, it is a pitiful fact that we have allowed hatred to so grow in our country that, that people can't even have a kind word to say to somebody. Amen. Mo, uh, Joseph was dealing with this and struggling with this. His brothers so hated him that they couldn't even say a kind word towards him. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4 says, You fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And we need dads back in the homes where they're raising their children in the nurture and admonition of God. Uh, not based on what, what society is doing or trends in the world we're living in, but what does God have to say about it? Now, God is no respecter of persons, so what right do we have to respect someone above someone else? And oftentimes there's problems in families, problems in the homes because of sibling rivalry, because of the fact that uh, parents have not raised their children according to the word of God. I have a series of messages I preached years ago. The theme of the series of messages was called a child-centered home. And I preached that message years ago as a warning that if we do not start becoming parents that are biblical parents, dads do not start becoming spiritual men and leading their families the way the Bible says they're supposed to lead their families, they're going to cause resentment and anger and bitterness in their children, and things are going to get out of control. And where are we at in 2020? Oftentimes I preach, I often wonder, I go home and I tell my wife, I said, I wonder if, any, if, we, if one person listened to what I had to say today. Sibling rivalry. There's no place for hatred among uh, brothers and sisters. There's no place for hatred among brothers and sisters in Christ. There's no place for hatred in the world in which we live. Sibling, sibling rivalry. Joseph had to deal with, they were so angry and absolutely couldn't say anything kind about him to the point where they're plotting to take his life. And at least they did acknowledge, well, he is our brother, so they sold him into slavery. And you, you, listen, you have no idea how far hatred will go until you allow hatred to rule and reign in your heart and in your society. And so I see sibling rivalry. I see in chapter 37, in uh, verse 8, and you turn over there, these chapters, it's going to be turning through Genesis chapter 37 through 41, just highlighting some things. But notice in chapter 37 and verse 8, it says, And his brethren said unto him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us, or uh, shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. And so there is hatred towards him because of sibling rivalry, but there's hatred towards him because of spiritual insight. 
God gave him a dream. The dream revealed that his brethren would be bowing down before him one day. And, and as he reveals that dream that God gave him, the spiritual insight he has of what's going to take place in the future, they hated him the more. You know, the interesting thing is, is you might have problems in your home, whatever. You get saved, you get born again. You start living as a Christian supposed to live, and that creates more problems in the home. I remember years ago, I read a story about a girl, that little, a teenage girl. I think she was around 14, 15 years old. But she got saved. And as she got saved, her dad was not a Christian. He was a heathen. He was an alcoholic. He told her, he said, you're not allowed to go to church. And she said, well, I got saved. I'm going to go to church. I want to go to church and worship God. And, and he told her, he said, no, if you go to church, Every Sunday, when you go to church, when you come home, you're going to get a beating. And that, that teenage girl said, well, I love Jesus. He saved me, and I'm going to go to church. And every listen, every Sunday, she went to church, worshiping God, knowing that when she got home, she'd be beat. And that dad beat her unmercifully and uh, because of the fact that she wanted to worship God. It's interesting how hateful people can get when you have spiritual insight. It's how aggressive people can get when they don't agree with what the Word of God has to say. Amen. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12 says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And Joseph not only suffered persecution and trials in his life because of the hatred of his brothers, but he was hated because of his spiritual insight. So I see sibling rivalry. I see spiritual insight. But in chapter 37 and verse 28, I see that he was sold into bondage. Chapter 37 and verse 28 says, And then there passed by Midianites, merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, and they brought Joseph unto Egypt. And so this hatred brought a point to him to a point where he was literally sold as a slave. In John chapter 4 and verse 44, it says, For Jesus himself testified that a prophet hath no honor in his own country. Oftentimes what we do is we'll share our faith or live our faith in Christ based on whether we're accepted in this society or not. But the reality is this, for God to bless us and cause us to prosper in the midst of the hatred, it requires of us to live our life out and not compromise in our testimony for Christ. Because the reality is a person who's not saved is not going to embrace the cross of Christ. A person who's not saved is going to get upset if you try to witness to them or testify to them. Family members will get uh, agitated with you if you try to live your Christian life. I just know my wife and I, we got saved. I mean, we stirred up a real stink in the family. Sometimes people really got mad at us because of the fact we were living our Christian life. And uh, we people don't like to hear that. People don't like to see that. Friends of mine, you know, they were always coming to my house wanting to drink beer. I got saved. God delivered me from the devil's drink. I don't drink. and I didn't touch a drop of alcohol since I've been saved, since I've been born again. Friends of mine absolutely wouldn't come over to my house. Well, I want to come over, Mike. Well, come on over, but don't bring your beer with you. And no, nope, they wouldn't come over. Why? Because the alcohol is more important than you are. And then they get mad at, got mad at me because I wouldn't drink with them anymore. And I, I'm just saying this, realize this, that Joseph experienced real hatred and real opposition to the very point of his brother selling him as a slave to the Ishmaelites in the Midianite caravan, uh, our hatred got so strong. And so, but God was with him. God didn't abandon him. And listen, people may abandon you, people may abuse you, and people may reject you, but God can make you to prosper in the midst of hatred. And I believe God wants to do something miraculous in the days in which we live. And I believe he's going to do something great. So hatred. They had, he had to deal with hatred. Not only was he hated, but he was accused. He was accused. In chapter 39 and verse 7, 
Uh, we see that he is accused with a common temptation. Chapter 39 and verse 7 it says, And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eye upon Joseph and said, Lie with me. It's a common temptation. And uh, how we have to be careful that we don't allow ourselves to fall into the trap of adultery. Uh, and all, there's all kinds of immoral sins that are being floated in the face of the saved and the unsaved. And the Christians need to realize that, wait a minute, there is a common temptation that can come upon you. And Joseph is doing what is right. He's being blessed of God. His master's house is being blessed by God. And here comes the master's wife casting her eyes upon him. May I say this? Whenever God is moving and God is blessing, the devil's always ready to bring a temptation to you. Amen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 3, it says, There is no temptation, but that which is common to, uh, to man. But God will, with the temptation, also provide a means of escape. Oftentimes people say, well, you know, it's just tempted. Well, wait a minute. That temptation didn't come without God giving you a way to get out of it. And the interesting thing is that Joseph, I mean, he took off and he ran. Uh, he, he was like most people, they said, well, I can't run. I left my coat there. I need to go back and get my coat. Now, he didn't care about his coat being there. All he knew was this. He had to get out of the house. Now, may I say, when God uh, allows temptations to come in your life and the devil brings uh, accusations against you through te temptations that will come in your life, run away from them. Get away from it. Don't try to entertain it. Don't try to be a part of it. Today's world, the Christians try to say, well, you know, we just got to need tolerated. No, you don't tolerate that foolishness. You run away from it. And so he was accused through common temptation and with a continual temptation. Notice in chapter 39 and verse 10, it says that it came to pass as she spake to Joseph day by day. Oh my goodness, you didn't give up. And when he said, I'm out of here, I can't, I can't respond to you. My master's been good to me, and God has blessed me, and I don't want to do this wicked sin. She didn't stop. She just kept coming back day after day and after day. And may I say this, the temptations that will destroy your <laughs> life and your testimony don't just come one time. They come over, and they come over, and they come over again. And so in uh, uh, verse 11, it says, It came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business, and there was none of the men in the house there within. That's his first mistake, second mistake there. The first mistake is going in the house. The second mistake is going in the house, and there wasn't anybody there to be a witness. And uh, she caught him, it says in verse 12, by his garment saying, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. Well, he got out, praise God. But there is the opportunity for a false accusation. In verse 19, notice it's a compromise. He's compromised in the temptation. Not because of what he did, but because of the accusation against him. In verse 19, it says, It came to pass when his master heard the words of his wife, which he spake unto him, saying, After this matter did thy servant to me, that his wrath was kindled. And so a compromise in the temptation, realizing this, that the devil is the accuser of the brethren, and the devil will do whatever he can to, to bring an accusation against you. As a Christian, you're to live your life separated, removed from these sinful conducts and actions. Uh, over the years, I've had people say, I'm ridiculous, I'm stupid, and I'm this, that, and the other. Well, that's ridiculous. I remember years ago, I was preaching about teens and saying, teens, uh, Christians don't dance. And then, now I'm going to get some of you mad at me. I was preaching, on Christians don't dance. And teenagers shouldn't be going to the prom. And oh, I was preaching all of this. And the Bible says it's good for a man not to touch a woman. And I tell you, you go through all that, and I've had, man, I had parents upset with me. I think my kids should be able to go to the prom. I think it's okay for them to dance. You know, where are those kids now? They're adults. Do you see them in church? No. Do you see them in church? No. You, you see their life? I know what their life is, and they've been defiled. And they've been corrupted. You say, well, that's just ridiculous. I'm just saying this. You better stay so far away from sin that nobody can accuse you. 
That's why I don't drive women in my car. I don't pick up women, take them home or anything like that. If a woman's getting in my car, my wife's going to be in the car. <laughs> and I don't, I don't allow myself to be exposed. I don't do private counseling all by myself with women over and over again and all this. You know, because I do not want an accusation brought against me. Let alone actually fall into some sin. And why? Why? Because God's in his life. God is blessing him. Everything he's doing, everything he's touching, God is making it to prosper. But you realize this, that in the midst of that atmosphere, the old devil is ready to bring something into your life to tempt you to fall by the wayside. You go to weddings. And they bring out the wine to make a toast to the groom. Remember when I got saved, a buddy of mine wanted me in his wedding, and I got saved, and I was stayed in. I went in his wedding, but I remember this: uh, they came up time for the toasting the bride and the groom. I didn't drink that uh, that alcohol. No way. You say that's ridiculous. Everybody else, it's just a little glass of wine. Hey, I know what that little glass of wine did in my life. What, what I'm, saying, I'm saying this, God will prosper you and bless you in the midst of all kinds of trials, but realize the accuser is there. And he's ready to accuse you for wrongdoing, whether you did it or whether you didn't do it. And so um, we have a high priest, Hebrews tells us, which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Jesus Christ never committed one sin, but there were accusers that put him on the cross. And you think your life is beyond what Christ experienced? The accuser is always waiting for you. So God blessed uh, Jacob, I'm going to Joseph, in the midst of hatred. He blessed him in the midst of accusations. Not only was he hated and accused, but he was forgotten. Chapter 39 in uh, verse 22, notice he provides sound leadership. It says in verse uh, 22 of chapter 39, uh, and the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison and whatsoever they did, he was the doer of it. So sound leadership. The prison, the prison guard, the keeper of the prison, saw the skills that Joseph had. He was aware of the blessings of God in Joseph's life. And so he committed all these things to Joseph to oversee. The amazing thing is in verse 13 and 19 of chapter 40, we see sincere leading or sincere leadership. Uh, Mo, uh, Joseph would speak to these two men, the baker and the butler, that were in prison and they both had dreams, and Joseph in chapter 40 and verse 13, and also chapter 40 and verse 19, told the one, you're going to be delivered, told the other, you're going to die. He was sincere in his leading. He didn't lie to them. Now, folks, we have the word of God. God reveals to us what's going on in the world and what's coming to pass. We need to be honest with people. And so sincere leading. And then there was a solemn leading in chapter 40, verse 23. It says, yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but before God yet. You say, well, people don't remember me. People, I've done this for so-and-so, and they've never acknowledged it. Uh, I, I've tried to live for the Lord, and nothing has happened in my life, and God's just forgotten about me. Realize this. In this world, you will be forgotten. But listen, God has not forgotten who you are, and God will bless you because chapter 40 and verse 23 tells us the butler forgot Joseph, but in chapter 41 and verse 1, it says it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh dreamed, and behold, he stood by the river. And so there is a time point, there is a place where you'll be honored, you'll be acknowledged in what God did in blessing your life. So I'm, Isaiah 40 and verse 31 says, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And what does that tell me? It tells me that uh, there is a place and a time when God exalts us. And so we see Joseph hated, accused, and forgotten. 
But now you're going to see Joseph exalted. And that's why chapter 41 in verse 1 tells us at the end of two years, God's timing is always perfect. In Galatians 4.4, 4, it tells us about Jesus coming in the fullness of time God sent forth his son. It was exact timing that God knows what's going on when he sent his son into this world to be the savior of this world. God's timing is right in your life. God's never early and he's never late. God is always on time. Joseph, you realize in Joseph, I think when he went into prison, if I remember correctly, he was around 17 years old. <clears throat> and when he goes, takes leadership in Egypt, he's 30 years old. So we're talking about a time span here of around 13 years, 13 or 14 years in Joseph's life. But it's, his life is timed out according to God's time. And so here he is, he's uh, going to interpret the dream of Pharaoh. So we see God's timing. We see God's revealing in verse 13. It came to pass as he interpreted, uh, he interpreted to us, so it was. So now, all of a sudden, the butler remembers uh, about Joseph uh, interpreting his dream. Then in verse 14, it says, Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon, and he shaved himself and changed his raiment and came in unto Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I have dreamed a dream, and there is none that can interpret it. And I have heard say of thee that thou canst understand a dream to interpret it. And Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. I am thankful that Joseph is still willing in the midst of all the trials and all the difficulties and all the suffering that he's gone through, he's still acknowledging that God is the one that does the revealing. It is not us that do the revealing. It is God who reveals what it is in our life. And so we see God's revealing. We see God's responding in chapter 41 and uh, verse 32. Chapter 41 and verse 32 tells us where am I here? It says, and for the, for the dream, and for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice. It is because that the thing is established by God and God will shortly bring it to pass. And so God's responding is this. He gave the dream twice to Pharaoh for emphasis. He revealed it twice, God's responding, that this is about what is going to take place. There's going to be a famine in the land and you need to get ready for it. And I, I believe that we need to get ready for what God's about ready to do in this world. And I believe with all my heart that he's about ready to really shake some things up. So jo Joseph is going to experience the exaltation of God in his life. God's timing, God's revealing, God's responding. In verse 40 of chapter 41 is God's exalting. It says that thou shalt be over my house. This is Pharaoh speaking to Joseph. It says, and according unto thy word shall all the people be ruled only in the throne will I be greater than thou. Think of all that Joseph has gone through. The hatred of his brethren, being sold as a slave in the Midianite caravan, uh, becoming a leader in the home of a, a, a well-respected uh, uh, master in the land of Egypt and being falsely accused accused of committing an immoral act and thrown into prison and then being a helpful leader in the prison and then forgotten in the prison, but now he's being exalted. There's not one person that's higher than Joseph in all the land of Egypt. You say, well, what, what does that mean? It means the Lord made him to prosper. Joseph could not have gotten to that point if it wasn't for his God making him to prosper is exalting then God's prospering in verse 51 chapter 41 and verse 51 and 52 it says that Joseph called the name of his firstborn Manasseh for God said he hath made me forget all my toil and all my father's house and the name of the second called he Ephraim 
For God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. The interesting thing is here is the prospering of God is God takes away the memory of the hurts of the past. God heals the broken heart of the past. And Joseph, listen, Joseph is now like 30 years old, over 30 years old. God has blessed him with children, two sons, and he names the one Manasseh because it means that God has made me to forget my toil. You know, we, we live in an era in history, especially in America, that everybody thinks they need to remember everything of their past. Every heartache, every discomfort, Every failure, every problem of my past, we got to constantly be talking about the past. The problem is you can't change the past. You cannot make the past go away. History is history. And we in America are trying to rewrite history because we're trying to make ourselves feel good. No, it is turning to God who can make everything prosper that brings the healing in my heart and makes me aware of the fact that I don't need to be controlled and manipulated by the toil of my past. Amen. Because God has set me free and he's made me a new creation. Amen. And then he says, not only has God helped me forget my past, he said, God is helping me in the present to be fruitful in the future. It says, for God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. He didn't say the affliction was going to go away. You realize that the greatest blessing of Joseph was overseeing uh, the rule in uh, Egypt and all the fruit and all the uh, grain that was stored to be able to be distributed to the world. But you do understand that he's living in a famine. We all have a tendency to look at him and say, well, wait a minute, you know, wow, God really blessed him. He's second only to, there's the only person that's higher than him is Pharaoh. And boy, I'll tell you what, what a place of blessing he's in and what a place of prospering he's experiencing. He's in the middle of a famine. He's directed Egypt to prepare for the famine to come. But his prospering was not only in the midst of hatred with his brothers, not only in the midst of accusations of Potiphar's house, not only in the middle of the prison being forgotten, but his prosper prospering is at the point of famine in the land as God blesses him and get, makes him fruitful so not only will he sustain his own life, but the life of those in the world. Amen. How? The Lord made it prosper. You say, well, I just don't know what's going to happen in this world I'm living in. I don't either. But God does. Well, you don't understand. Well, I'm really struggling. No, you need to understand the God who created you and saved you is the God who will prosper you in the world in which we live. We are not failures. We are not defeated. We are victors through faith in Jesus Christ. We are more than conquerors of him that saved us and loved us. We are on the winning side. So let God do his bidding and his will and his way and his timing so that we might be exalted for his glory. See, when God does the exalting, then he gets the glory. The Lord made it to prosper. What's in your life you need God to touch? What's in your life you need God to prosper? What is it God needs to do in a miraculous life? Is it health? Is it sorrow? Is it emotions? Is it family? Is it job? Is it finances? What do you need God to make it work? Every aspect of human society is experienced through Joseph in Genesis chapter 37 through chapter 50. And God made everything he touched to prosper. And I believe that God can make us to prosper and be successful in our Christian life. Well, let's pray. Amen. My Father, I come to you. I thank you for grace. I thank you, Lord, that we can know that we're saved. I would pray, Lord, whether it be someone here in the building or whether it be someone watching live stream, 
that needs to be saved, I pray they would come and give us the opportunity to show them how to believe on Christ. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And so help us, O oh God, to experience that new life in Christ. I would pray, Lord, for believers, those of us that are saved. It's, it's a difficult thing sometimes to continue to be positive and be assured of the fact that God is with us when it seems like everything's falling apart around us. But God, you're the one that created all things. You're the one that sustains all things. And uh, Lord, our lives are hid in you. And so I pray that you might bless us, encourage us, and strengthen us with the truth and the reality of how you made everything that Joseph do prosper. And so Lord, help us through the trials and difficulties in our life to see the hand of God's blessing. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you.